It is a great pleasure to moderate this discussion today uh, with my two um, senior colleagues that I have respected. Um, I will call them my senpais because clearly you're my senpai at Columbia. Um, and um, Dr. Michita, um, you are my senpai at in the Defense Ministry. Um, so today we'll be talking about the US Japan, Japan, US alliance and Trump era and beyond. But first we'd like to get everybody to familiarize themselves with where Japan is right now. And there, I would like to turn to Dr. Michishita for an uh, overview of where the Japan's defense establishment is. And he okay. has some slides for us, so sure. let's... Right. Let's okay, on. thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you very much, uh, Asia Society, for organizing this. Um, where is Japan uh, going? Um, some people say that Japan is moving away from pacifism toward militarism. Uh, Japan is remilitarizing, making, you know, uh, acquiring new capabilities and things like that. But in fact, in my opinion, I would say that Japan is actually moving away from isolationism toward internationalism. Why? Because for two reasons. Uh, well, uh, first, in the first place, um, why is, has Japan been uh, um, isolationist? Well, Japan suffered a lot uh, in the war, which it started uh, against the United States, and uh, kind of learned a lesson, big lesson. Don't go to, you know, get involved in stupid wars, right? <laughs> again, never again. And uh, that was a lesson that's still alive in the, you know, uh, in the uh, minds of large number of Japanese people. So uh, people's natural reaction to Japan's, you know, Japan making a commitment to international security is like, no more, we don't want to do it. You know, we don't want to get involved in dirty, messy wars and conflicts and uh, international politics. So we stay away from them. That's this, the sentiment, right? So that's uh, isolation. And, and when we talk about sending uh, self-defense force, our armed forces, troops to foreign countries, we, to, we, we you know, say, well, we, if, what if uh, we take casualties? That would be a disaster. So that we can't send any troops. So that's uh, the sense, you know, it's a kind of good news that we don't have, you know, have not been, have not been sending troops to foreign countries. We don't have to, you know, being pacifist isolationist, um, we have been able to, you know, kind of, well, we didn't have to put our servicemen and women in harm's way. Isn't it a good news? So it was, uh, you know, comfortable, uh, easy uh, policy to take. But uh, when, especially after uh, Prime Minister Abe came into office, things have started to change. Why is Japan changing and moving, start, decided to move away from isolationism toward internationalism? Two major reasons. One, uh, rising threats. North Korea is, uh, has acquired already nuclear weapons, more than 10 nukes. I don't know, some people say up to 60 nuclear weapons. And uh, North Korea has acquired a large number of uh, short-range, short more than 500 short-range missiles, but uh, uh, more than 200 missiles targeted at Japan. We are talking about uh, North Korea developing ICBM internet, intercontinental ballistic missiles targeted at the U.S. We are making a fuss, but you know, if you come to Japan, welcome. You are already in the, the range <laughs> of North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons. So that's one. China is rising. China claims its sovereignty over the Japanese islands called the Senkaku Islands. Uh, China is developing, uh, you know, have acquired uh, new aircraft carriers, larger number of uh, missiles and nuclear weapons, and it's expanding both at sea and in the air. So we have to respond to it, them. Second reason is uh, policy of the United States. Mr. Trump, has been, well, you know, kind of so far, he's doing an okay job when it comes to a, um, you know, maintaining uh, U.S. commitment to the uh, security in the Indo-Pacific region. But, you know, you know, if you take a look at, uh, you know, if you, how many of you have read the book uh, by uh, uh, Bob Woodward uh, entitled Fear? 
Yeah, okay, some of you. That's a very interesting, depressing, but interesting book <laughs> to read. Uh, so in that book, he, uh, you know, the anecdote at the outset of the book talks about how Mr. Trump wanted to pull out uh, for U.S. forces from South Korea, right? So he has, a, by nature, he seems to be, has a strong isolationist sentiment, right? So if it's possible, uh, he would like to re reduce U.S. commitment to the security in the Indo-Pacific region. We understand it. We try to, you know, prevent him to f from going too far, but uh, we have to hedge against. So that's a, a second reason why Japan is making more commitment uh, to the maintenance uh, of international security, uh, because China is rising, North Korea is nuclearizing, while the U.S. commitment might uh, uh, re uh, diminish uh, fairly significantly. So together, uh, that's w what we are doing why and why. Thank you. Um, so at this point, Dr. Smith, um, in your recent book, Japan Rearmed, um, I, there's a quote that I really um, thought was wonderful, which is, the military once feared as a security liability now appears to be an indispensable asset called upon with increasing frequency and given a seat at the policymaking table. I think it echoes what Dr. Michisto just, just said about isolationism to internationalism, but is this how you look at it too? And what is there something you might want to add about why this is happening and how it's happening? Sure, thank you. And, and again, thank you to the Asia Society for inviting me. It's great to be with Michisto-san and uh, Hikotani-san as well. Um, you know, the, the, the book that I wrote, Japan Rearmed, was really a, an effort to help American policymakers understand the many dimensions mm -hmm. under which Japanese policy is changing. So one of them, as uh, Professor Michisa pointed out, is threat perception, the rising threat in the, in the Asian region that Japan is under and responding to as well. But there's some un internal dynamics, dynamics that, that, that Professor Hikotani has written about um, as well. But what I wanted to point out is the end of the Cold War really began to shift the way in which Japan thought about its military as an instrument of statecraft, right? not just as an instrument to deal with threats, but also to deal with us, quite frankly. I mean, as the Cold War ended, the United States began to look to its allies to play more a greater role in coalition activities, things like the first Gulf War, but more recently after 9-11, the coalition mm -hmm. response to, to uncertainty in the Gulf. And now we see it in things like anti-piracy in the Gulf of Aden. We see it in terms of patrols of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the Straits of Hormuz. So the U.S. expectation of its allies was less about defense in the region and more about how do we come together um, and think about global security threats. So Japan, very haltingly, began to respond to that expectation on the part of Washington uh, as well. Um, but I think the most conspicuous way in which Japan has responded is really in response to the region. And I think here you see mission by mission, you see the Japanese military thinking about, well, how do we deal with the ballistic missile threat from North Korea? Well, we invest in ballistic missile defenses with the United States. How do we deal with the growing maritime and air pressures that are coming from a much more active and much more powerful Chinese military? Well, we again work through the alliance, but we develop our maritime and air uh, readiness and preparatory ability. I think what you've also seen on the civilian side is you've seen laws being passed that allow the military to take its seat at the table in the way that we normally think that military should take their seat at the table when thinking about national security responses. And, you know, again, Japan's long post-war history has been one that has been quite resistant to having the military play an active role in public policy, even in defense policy. The civilians in the Ministry of Defense, or today's Ministry of Defense, as well as in the cabinet, took a secondary role to civilian uh, planners and thinkers. Today, I think there's much more welcome for the uniformed services in Japan to take their seat at the table, not as expansionist forces, right? Not to reminiscent of the pre-war period, but to bring their professional expertise to the conversation about what kind of capabilities do we need to enhance? What kind of investments do we need to make? How do we recruit? for the future to make sure we've got the capabilities that we can deploy in the region for Japan's defenses. So you see a lot of different ways in which Japan, uh, Japanese policymakers, but also the Japanese public, have a greater appreciation for the role that their military can play in assuring Japan is well defended and assuring that the Japanese people feel secure. So these are the kinds of changes I, I go over in my book. They're cumulative. They're not all about threat perception. 
because some of them have to do with the institutional place of the military and the policy making process. But they're all added up uh, to a point today where I think the Japanese military is one of many instruments that the Japanese government can bring to bear when it thinks about its, its broader strategy in the region and beyond. The one thing, if I can, at the end of the book, um, I, don't, I conclude by asking the question, well, is Japan about to move out of this position of restraint hmm. in terms of the use of force? And I argue in the book that it's not threat perception alone that's going to change the way Japan organizes its security, i.e. reliance on the United States for extended deterrence, but also territorial or uh, area defense by the, by the self-defense forces. What I think is crucial is the American willingness to continue to commit to the strategic protection of Japan. In other words, our policies on the alliance mm -hmm. and our consistency in providing support to Japan is going to be the critical variable, I think, for the future th thought processes in, J in Japanese policymaking. Let me say a word on that point. Mm -hmm. Um, some people say, think that Japan will become really aggressive, you know. Um, I don't think so. Uh, why? Because first, I mean, as I said, um, you know, Japan has been very isolationist and moving slowly away from it toward internationalism. But still, there are, you know, isolationist, strong isolationist sentiment uh, remaining in Japan. And that there are actually people, isolationists and internationalists, uh, contending with each other even today, right? So many, you know, not many, but uh, quite a number of people hate Abe for being, you know, trying to be, uh, make Japan more internationalist. Mm -hmm. They are saying, why are you doing this stupid? I mean, we are, have been staying away from, uh, you know, dirty, messy foreign mm -hmm. cri crisis and uh, conflict. You are getting Japan involved in those, and that's stupid, right? Don't do it. That's the sentiment of isolationists. And it's still there. So um, I don't know. Um, it's quite uh, interesting to see what happens after Abe, right? His uh, term of in office will expire. Uh, in September next year. So uh, that's one thing and uh, still, so we'll see. And uh, some people also uh, think that if the constitution of Japan is amended, uh, Japan will become much more, um, how should I say, uh, proactive in military affairs. Again, I don't agree with it because it's not the constitution. It's an isolationist sentiment uh, that's preventing Japan. You know, it's a good, you know, certainly isolationism is a, has a positive, as, you know, um, a, uh, aspect. Like, as I said, I mean, we don't have to put our servicemen and women in harm's way. That's a good news, right? So why, why not keep doing it? But uh, internationalists are saying, well, we might not be able to keep doing it. Thank you. Um, so since you raised the name Prime Minister Abe, um, now I'd like to turn to um, Dr. Smith now about the Abe-Trump relationship, because many argue that Abe weathered the storm better maybe than other countries. And it's true that most of the Japanese public still, I think the support for the U.S.-Japan alliance is very high. I think at the military to military level, the ties are much stronger than ever. And yet, there are still concerns about alliance from the Trump Abe factor. So how do you address the situation now with the alliance, especially with the two leaders and their uh, relationship? So I think a lot, of, a lot of weight is put both among Japanese and even in Washington mm -hmm. um, on the value of the political management of the relationship by Prime Minister Abe. And again, if you compare the U.S.-Japan alliance to the NATO alliance, for mm -hmm. example, or to the U.S. ROK alliance, which is going through a considerable period of strain at the moment, uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance still looks pretty good, pretty solid, even in the era of yeah. President Trump, where, you know, to be quite frank, alliances have come under incredible scrutiny, uh, not only for the question of whether American forces should be deployed abroad, but for how much allies should pay. Um, so this is, a, this is a moment in which this new, you know, thinking about are the alliances really good for America has really taken hold a little bit across the American public debate. Um, but I think the U.S.-Japan alliance has quietly, I mean, Prime Minister Abe has quietly navigated uh, the, the kind of disruptive impulses, I think, uh, of the president when it comes to alliances. Um, two pieces of the puzzle. One, of course, we have to remember is not about military cooperation, but is rather about trade. 
And um, even though they had a close working relationship, it didn't uh, absolve Japan of some scrutiny on the trade realm, as you know. The, on steel and aluminum, there was a great deal of pressure on mm-hmm. Japan. And then, obviously, uh, the president really wanted a bilateral trade agreement with, United, with, with Japan mm-hmm. and used the, the threat of potentially uh, put, imposing tariffs on autos to try to get that through. That worked. And again, I think there is a, a, a quite careful management of that problem by Tokyo. But at the end, a bilateral trade deal was concluded, mm-hmm. uh, even though Prime Minister Abe wasn't so enthusiastic about it initially. Um, but I think what's really key here is what we're going to um, look at in the next upcoming year, and that is this debate over host nation support or burden mm-hmm. sharing, as we call it. Again, as I mentioned, the U.S. and South Korea have paid, uh, are in the middle of this very tortuous negotiation about how much fiscal contribution South Korea makes to the presence of U.S. forces. Japan's uh, agreement with the United States is a five-year agreement. That'll be coming up for renegotiation starting in January. So it's a pretty critical time on that side. Mm-hmm. But as you said, Hikako, the, the, the military-to-military relationship between the United States and Japan is very strong. Our forces in the Indo-Pacific, quite frankly, our 7th Fleet couldn't operate mm-hmm. without the bases in Japan, as you both know quite well. Uh, we have the only uh, aircraft carrier uh, task force stationed abroad, is stationed in Yokosuka. So the value, the strategic value to the United States of the mm-hmm. alliance is far beyond just the defense of Japan uh, assessment that the president sometimes talks about. It's really our ability to deploy and to operate across the Indo-Pacific. Mm-hmm. Depends on cooperation with the self-defense forces, but also the ability to use facilities in Japan. So I hope, I hope that that larger strategic mm-hmm. picture will guide our mm-hmm. conversation mm-hmm. about burden sharing going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah, um, good news, as uh, um, Dr. Smith said, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance, U.S.-Japan relationship is in a good shape. Uh, relationship between Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe is good. Uh, they played golf together. They took selfie together, tweeted it. You know, they did a good job. And uh, Japan, but uh, there is a limit to what uh, Mr. Abe can do because uh, last year in May. Uh, Japan invited Mr. Trump as a state guest and uh, basically conducted the big treat diplomacy, right? Um, It kind of uh, looked, uh, you know, seemed, appeared to have worked well. But after just a month later, in June, uh, Mr. Trump appeared on TV and he said, um, if there is a third world war, uh, the United States will be fighting while the Japanese people would be watching it on Sony TV. That's what he said, right? And uh, the one thing he got, uh, got wrong uh, was the fact that there's no Sony TVs anymore. <laughs> they are like Samsung and LG TVs. I mean, there is no, how can you watch uh, the war on so- Sony TV, which is not non-existent. But anyway, so th- that there is a limit to uh, what uh, she, Mr. Abe can achieve. And also in terms of uh, uh, host nation support, currently South Korea is uh, paying like uh, $1 billion, a lot of money uh, to the US, uh, while Japan is paying like uh, $2 billion, right? And uh, Mr. Trump is asking South Korea to uh, increase it uh, fivefold, right? And reportedly, Mr. Trump is asking Japan to uh, re- re- uh, increase the number of figure by four times, right? So we'll see uh, what will happen. But the one thing we have to make sure um, that he understands is uh, how South Korea's defense effort and Japanese uh, you know, alliances, U.S. ROK, South Korea alliance, and the U.S. Japan alliance, are not only about the defense of South Korea or defense of Japan, but it's about uh, uh, the security and peace and stability in the, in, in the Pacific region. Uh, Japan is uh, actually, um, it's not U.S. Japan. People, many people think that uh, Japan, U.S. Japan alliance is there to defend Japan. True, but it's also there to defend South Korea. For example, uh, one big active uh, operation plan, war plan, that the U.S. and Japan has right now, after the end of the Cold War, is all plan 5055, which is designed uh, for the two countries to fight together in case of Korean contingency. 
So it's not about just about uh, defense of Japan, but defense of the region. Mm -hmm. And I would like to really uh, make sure that uh, Mr. Trump and the U.S. Uh, um, you know, specialist and policymaker in this country, in the U.S., uh, understands that. Since we're on this point of the Korean Peninsula, how concerned are you about the recent difficulty or increasing difficulty between um, Japan and Korea, uh, South Korea, uh -huh. on defense issues? Because in some ways, their political issues were difficult, history issues were difficult, but in some ways, the military to military part, once again, seemed more resilient. Now it seems to be challenged. How, what is your assessment of this? Well, I mean, we always, uh hear bad news about uh, what's going on between Japan and uh, South Korea. So I give you a good news today, <laughs> which is why is South Korea kind of attacking Japan very much while it doesn't do the same with China, right? You know, sometimes uh, South Korea pick a fight with China. What happened to South Korea? China really ground, you know, attacked, you know, fight, fought back and retaliated against what South Korea did. And South Korea, you know, it, when South Korea, for example, decided to allow the U.S. to deploy a uh, third uh, missile defense system, it's a terminal high altitude area defense system. China said, not do it, don't do it. And if when South Korea decided to accept those missiles. I mean, China really imposed uh, real sanctions on uh, South Korea's business activities in China. So South Koreans are really, uh, they fear China's retaliation, right? Fear China. While, so when it comes to China, South Korean people and the leaders are very cautious. They keep saying bad things about Japan for a long time, why? Because Japan would not fight back as China does, right? So South Koreans are much more relaxed about picking a fight with Japan. It's a bad news, right, for us because we, our relationship is very important. However, it's kind of a good news to me. I'm, I'm a Korea specialist, I speak Korean. I talk to my Korea uh, friends all the time. It's a good news because they, don't fear Japan. They are relaxed about Japan. They know that Japan is a reasonable country, so they keep picking a fight with more or less a, with a impunity. And is it a good news, bad news? Maybe bad news, but it can be a good, a good news in the long run. We'll how, see. Yeah. How about you, Shiloh? How does it look from an American I'm trying point of view? It's the, really the good news scenario. Yeah, I was wondering what is the good news in this from the U.S. perspective. I but. like that interpretation. So I, I, that, that's great. Um, so I think from from Washington's point of view, there's two things here that matter, right? One is obviously, and this has been a long-standing viewpoint of the U.S. government. I'm now looking at, 19, at the 1950s and looking back at American diplomatic documents in the 50s, and I'm, it's remarkable to me how similar the dynamics are. It's still sort of a, it's a, always been a concern of U.S. foreign policymakers that Seoul and Tokyo have obviously <coughs> residual issues and tensions. Um, but I think the interesting thing more recently for me is in 2017 when North Korea was lobbing the missiles, right, short range, medium range, and then testing the potential ICBMs that could reach the United States, all, all in the direction of Japan. It was sort of an unlevel, uh, unprecedented level of coordination between the two alliances. Mm -hmm. And it didn't quite get to a complete merger where you had self-defense forces landing on South Korean <laughs> territory or vice versa. But you had an unprecedented degree of signaling to the North that these alliances would function should there be a conflict. These alliances would function as integral components. Um, so I, we, we went from that to last year's tensions that really kind of seemed to be a spiral of deterioration. They were mm -hmm. over the South, the, the South Korean Supreme Court decisions on forced labor during the wartime. They then moved over into export restraints or export restrictions uh, on sensitive technologies from Japan. And then they, again, affected the information sharing agreement, the GSOMNIA, the uh, agreement that allows South Korea and Japan to share sensitive intelligence, right? Um, the good news, 
I would say is there was a pause in the deterioration. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, if you, we would have had this conversation last summer, we would have been a little bit more alarmed about the, the, the yeah. pace of deterioration of the mm -hmm. relationship because it didn't look like we could it could be stopped. Mm -hmm. And even if the even the Trump administration, mm -hmm. you know, chimed in after mm -hmm. the information sharing agreement was threatened by mm -hmm. Seoul, and that didn't seem to do any good, frankly. Right. So I think what we've got now is a pause. I think we've got efforts. So President Moon himself intervened and backed away from terminating the mm -hmm. information sharing agreement. South Korea, as you know, I'm sorry, North Korea, as you know, did a submarine launch test missile in which uh, South Korea openly asked mm -hmm. Japan to share information. The trajectory, of course, of that missile was in the direction of Japan. So mm -hmm. they wanted that information from Japan. Japan very conspicuously said, yes, you can have it. Mm -hmm. So there was some obvious diplomacy that was happening there. Yeah. Um, and uh, one thing, um, when South Korean uh, Minister of uh, National Defense announced uh, what happened between the two countries, uh -huh. they said Japan provided this information based on GSOMIA, yeah. which is a general security of military information right. agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. So both countries then recognize yeah. the value, the mutual value of this information sh sharing agreement, which is very important, I think. Right. The, the next thing that happened is working level talks on the export restrictions, the mm -hmm. oversight of the export of technology mm -hmm. happened. So you had a kind of, you know, decrease in the, te in the, in the hot tempers mm -hmm. uh, to a lower level of pragmatic policy solving. And right now we are still waiting to understand exactly how the court cases themselves mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. get worked out. That, of course, as everybody in this audience probably is aware, is the deeply sensitive mm -hmm. issue, political mm -hmm. issue yeah. on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm grateful for the pause. I'm not sure where we're going to end up, but at least we are not in the downward spiral of last year. And, and I hope that we will find a way for the United States to start playing a far more constructive role mm -hmm. in offering, not off ramps, but mm -hmm. offering ways in which we can constructively rebuild the trilateral mm -hmm. cooperation mm -hmm. uh, in a way that helps both Seoul and Tokyo uh, yeah. see a pathway forward. Because it's not exactly good news, good news. Away. It's, we have to ask North Korea to launch a missile for us to be friendly. So yeah, well. there's another well, there's a different way out. I wouldn't go quite through that far. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that's oh, one but, way um, to look at but, it. Um, but, so, um, but talking about the regional issues right. at large, um, I'd like to turn to the China issue. Mm -hmm. um, um, and in terms of what the defense strategies of two countries yeah. are, um, the language in the um, U.S. national defense strategy and the national defense program outlined in Japan are very similar, yeah. that um, China is a revisionist state trying to undermine, replace the international order is in the U.S. one. And then in Japan, it says uh, China engages in the unilateral coercive attempts to alter the status quo based on its own assertions that are incompatible with existing international order. So that's two very strong languages. But I guess on the other hand, while the U.S. is sort of consistent in that in the different aspects of other policy, Japan seems a little bit more friendly. We're trying to chart somewhat something that looks a bit different from what it says in the NDPO. Are we seeing possible differences or gaps between the U.S. and Japan with regards to China? That was all the talk at the Munich Defense Conference last like two weeks last week, two weeks ago. But is that something that we're starting to see between U.S. and Japan? Is that a possible issue for the lines going ahead that the assessments of where the China relationship should be might diverge in the long run? You're looking at me. So I, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I think our security bureaucracies, be the DOD mm -hmm. or the, Na the Ministry of Defense, are pretty much on the same page. Right. I think what was happening at the end of the Obama administration is there is rising fears mm -hmm. in Tokyo that we were more focused on Russia and the specific military threats of mm -hmm. Russia, we were prioritizing and less focused on China. I I'm not sure that was an accurate understanding, but I think there was worry. So I think there's been a deliberate effort on both sides mm -hmm. to synchronize the way we talk mm -hmm. about threat perception. And mm -hmm. so you saw in our national defense uh, strategy, which is not all about Japanese influence on our thinking, but but we had the we moved away from the post 9-11 focus on counterterrorism and the Middle East to a major power competition, and in, in particular, signaling out um, Russia and China mm -hmm. as the major mm -hmm. kind of focal points for that major mm -hmm. car, you know, that threat to the United States. Uh, Japan, interestingly enough, in the 2018, the December 2018 NDPG, which is their long 10-year defense statement, 
also identified Russia, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't just China, China right? Uh, the, there was also acknowledgement that Russia too was, was presenting a, a threat. Um, so I think there's been a little bit of coordination and synchronization so we're not on, the, on a different page or there's no gap here in terms of us understanding the behaviors of the militaries in terms of the, the threat to us. I think what's interesting if you go back historically is there's often been dissonance in the Japan, mm -hmm. China, U.S., relationship. You can go back to the 70s and the Nixon shocks. And we're not always on the same page. We're not always having a good diplomatic relationship with Beijing at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's often slight lags and then one country's relationship is slightly better because of certain breakthroughs. And mm -hmm. then, of course, Beijing has its own interest in not always having us on the same page. Um, but I don't really worry. Uh, some people in Washington sort of worry, maybe at the Munich conference, this is reflecting that concern mm -hmm. that Japan might go too far in its diplomacy with Xi Jinping when he comes to Japan for the state visit to see the cherry blossoms, as he says, right, <laughs> uh, in April. Um, I think on the trade side, China and Japan may see much, you know, the, the, they may see the same picture. They may worry about us, mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. and our move towards a more protectionist approach, right? So there are similar concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Abe has been very careful not to buy in mm -hmm. to Xi Jinping's language, that mm -hmm. they are buddy-buddy on the liberal trading order. Mm -hmm. There's very, there's a lot of care being taken here mm -hmm. by the Abe cabinet. Um, one thing that I think has been very interesting to watch is Foreign Minister Motegi, for example, has been quite outspoken in the in the months leading up to Xi's visit mm -hmm. on Hong Kong, mm -hmm. on other issues of democratic practice, mm -hmm. on the Taiwan elections, mm -hmm. for example. So I think you're hearing a stronger Japanese voice there in terms of cautioning, maybe, uh, the Chinese on their behavior and on this question of democratic practice and political instability and how they might respond. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as Japan's warming mm -hmm. with China as being multi as being unidimensional. Mm -hmm. I think there's quite yeah. different interests being expressed mm -hmm. as you see the lead up right. to the potential she visit. Right. So how do you um, see that, Dr. Mitish, yeah. the other potential she visit were the cherry blossoms blue. We're not too sure anymore. It's going to happen. But um, mm -hmm. I think the Japanese government has been very careful to say that the ball is in their court. And that yeah. would still could happen. It's just that it's been very warm in Japan and the cherry blossoms might bloom a little bit earlier than April. <laughs> and that might make things a little bit more complicated. Yes. But even given that, um, how do you see yeah. the Japan-China relation? Is it sort of diverging in a way or is it still pretty much on the same page with the U.S.? I think we are more or less on the same page, but the different timelines. Mm -hmm. um, I would characterize, I would say that uh, China and Japan are competing while cooperating, or co cooperating while competing either way, it's fine. And why is there is a, seems to be a gap between the US and Japan? Because we started earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During the Obama administration, the US uh, basically had a very strong engagement-oriented policy toward China. And uh, in the meantime, Japan was telling, you know, Obama administration people, policymakers, special, oh, China is doing this and that, and, uh, you know, potentially destabilizing the situation in the region. But the, uh, you know, U.S. administration, Obama administration was quite relaxed about what China was doing, right? So we are like, mm -hmm. you know, asking. Uh, but uh, while the U.S. was more sanguine about China, we were taking, Japan was taking necessary steps to counter what China was doing, right? So by now, in a way, Japan is in a much better shape in terms of uh, how we respond to China in a competitive way. So it's a time for us to start, you know, cooperating more than compete. So we are in a better shape than the U.S. on that regard. Mm -hmm. So that's a timeline difference. Mm -hmm. And another thing is uh, um, there are reasons for us, good reason uh, for us, Japan and China to cooperate. One is that the uh, uh, Asia Development Bank uh, uh, produced a report several years ago saying that there is a huge infrastructure demand in the Indo-Pacific region, which cannot be fulfilled by any one nation. Even China's big you know, uh, Belt and Road Initiative cannot fulfill the demand or AI, uh, AD, AIB. Oh, oh. AIIB, thank you. <laughs> AIIB uh, will not do it. So uh, Japan, China, the US, other countries must get together and uh, 
try to do the job, you know, uh, kind of share the roles uh, and uh, in order to uh, provide the necessary quality infrastructure investment in the region. So that's one. Another thing is Japan was first reluctant uh, to cope with China in terms of regional development. Why? Because uh, we thought that uh, China might be using it, uh, you know, economic uh, leverage in order to expand its political and diplomatic influence, strategic influence in the region. So it's more like unilateral, you know, uh, selfish type of approach. But then th we thought, Maybe you know letting China do the job on it, its own might be actually might create a worse result, right? Mm -hmm. If we engage with what China is, you know, engage with China and work with China, we while we keep on eyes on what China is doing, maybe China will do a better better job of providing a mutually beneficial, fiscally economically sound, uh, environmentally friendly investment infrastructure investment in the region right so what by getting involved mm -hmm. i think we, we it's going to be a win-win not only for china and japan but also uh, for the mm -hmm. countries in the region mm -hmm. that's yeah can i just add one sure. short note because sure. i think it's important to understand too that i think there's lots of ways in which japan and chinese interests in the region come into confrontation but they also have common interests, exactly. right? And mm -hmm. so I think what's been interesting to watch is if you look from, you know, the Senkaku crisis from 2010, 2012, the blow up over the islands, right? Mm -hmm. The military tensions. If you look at how mm -hmm. Abe and Xi have re-engaged. Mm -hmm. So from the APEC 2014 meeting where you have that, you know, iconic picture where she's going like this, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it looks terrible. <laughs> and now you look at it, it's like normal, yeah. back to normal kind right. of diplomacy. But what's been very interesting in the lead up to the potential state visit this mm -hmm. spring is, is Prime Minister Abe has attempted to sort of say, okay, you can say BRI and I'll say free and open exactly. in the Pacific, yeah. right? And so, but basically what we want is to meet the infrastructure demand that you mm -hmm. suggested, to raise the bar perhaps on not only AIIB giving, mm -hmm. but also the kinds of quality infrastructure or lending practices that the Chinese are doing. So, but the, also to find mm -hmm. that common sweet spot where, where both, both powers are looking mm -hmm. at the region, right. not necessarily completely in terms of competition, but mm -hmm. also in these complementarities. And mm -hmm. I think it's a very savvy approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not sure that Xi Jinping is reciprocating that kind of savviness, but that'll be, that's why the state visit or the mm -hmm. impending state mm -hmm. visit is kind of interesting for all of us to see is not just the bilateral, mm -hmm. but also how the regional right. kind of conversation right. proceeds. Right. And I think that's it, important. It's kind of interesting what happened in uh, October 2018 when Xi Jinping and uh, Abe met in Beijing. Yeah. And uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Smith said, um, Japan wanted to use a free and for it, you know, free and open in the Pacific. This is a vision of right. that Japan has in for the region and the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, which is a vision that China has for the region. You know, we didn't want to buy into BRI. They didn't want to buy into FOIP. So we came up with an interesting concept, new concept, third country cooperation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we, you know, work together in third countries, like in, you know, countries in the Indo-Pacific region so that uh, both sides can save face, right? That's a mm -hmm. smart way of uh, doing the job mm -hmm. together. And another an interesting anecdote coming out of um, this uh, meeting in um, October 2018 was that, um, so they met in October. In December, you know, usually uh, Chinese Coast Guard vessels, like uh, eight to 14 vessels, enter the Japanese territory waters around the Senkak Islands every month, right? In December, no Chinese vessel entered the uh, waters. So we said, wow. Now China is changing, and uh, you know it's, it's not coming in mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a, now it's a really uh, summit meeting flourished. Mm -hmm. Then in the <laughs> January there was a big jump to 14, 14, 14, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we were like, okay. <laughs> so there is a limit to what uh, summit right. meeting or you know right. there is a limit to cooperation, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean we understand it. So while while we 
cooperate, we compete, or well, we compete, we cooperate. Mm -hmm. um, just throwing in the free and open Indo-Pacific, because mm -hmm. I think that's something that I think two years ago we were in the same conference where I think the general agreement is there isn't that much meat on the bone. And that the U.S. and Japan seems to have a little bit different mm. meanings to the free and open Indo-Pacific. Do you still think that it's a convenient vehicle, like vehicle, I don't know is the right word, but there is something that's in sync right now between mm -hmm. Japan and the U.S. Is it helpful to have that concept going forward, or and is there more meat on the bone from the U.S. perspective, do you think? So I think the Japanese concept, and if you look on the webpage, and mm -hmm. you know all of Japan's instruments, uh, instruments of influence are brought to bear yeah. on this, right? And this has taken a decade or more to develop. It just didn't pop up overnight. Mm -hmm. So, But I think the Japanese conception, and again, the free and open Indo-Pacific is a Japanese term. Prime Minister Abe has advocated for it and has pulled all these economic instruments mm -hmm. and the military as well together. I think on the U.S. side, we suffered somewhat. Our hard power, obviously, in the region is much more dominant way we, we, we influence issues. So we have our military presence in the region, which is very valuable. What we did not have and still are lagging behind are the economic resources. We have private sector investment, obviously. Mm -hmm. So our commercial mm -hmm. interest in the region is vast. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, the, it was the development assistance financing that would allow us to help with the infrastructure mm -hmm. that was really lacking. So last year, Congress passed a new law, mm -hmm. and we now have a new development bank it has been upgraded. Some of you may know of the old OPIC. It was a small bank. Uh, now it's a much bigger one mm -hmm. with much bigger resources. Not as much as Japan has. Certainly not as much as China can bring to bear in the region. But it does give us a little bit more heft in the mm -hmm. development financing side and the infrastructure investment side. Mm -hmm. But the long-term focus will be things like LNG, mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. um, and there we may end up competing a little bit with Japan mm -hmm. over uh, LNG kind of infrastructure mm -hmm. in the region. There will be digital resources. That's mm -hmm. an, a, a big area of American commercial and government interest. Um, and so we may find ourselves wanting the same outcome, mm -hmm. but not necessarily exploring it always together. We may mm -hmm. be a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, I think, in the aggregate, I mm -hmm. think that's probably yeah. good for the region. I don't so, think that's a negative. One of the reasons why we, there is a gap is, uh, you know, comparative advantage that we have, you know, each of us has. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has a ma tremendous comparative advantage on military capabilities. Mm -hmm. We have that advantage, at least vis-a-vis -vis the region mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Pacific region economic uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's only natural for our FOIP to be more focused on the economic side of it, mm -hmm. the story, while the U.S. have a, a more security-oriented mm -hmm. FOIP. Mm -hmm. And another reason, Japan, actually, the, the Japanese government uh, consciously <coughs> desecuritized mm -hmm. FOIP after nine, 2018, partly because uh, we wanted to make the concept of vision more, pop, uh, more acceptable uh, to the countries in the region. For example, um, you know, Southeast Asian countries, if they are forced to choose between China and Japan, they say, no, we are not going to make that choice, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we present our FOIP, Japan, Japanese FOIP, as a security, strongly security-oriented concept, they are not going to buy it, right? But uh, we really need a region-wide cooperation on this concept, especially the economic side of the story. Mm -hmm. So we said, OK, we desecretize this, and uh, so this is uh, you know, much more acceptable to you. And, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean to say that uh, security mm -hmm. effort that we are making has uh, diminished. We mm -hmm. continue to make a necessary security effort mm -hmm. Uh, to maintain balance of power in this region, you know, kind of uh, t uh, keeping our eyes on what China is doing by basically three things uh, quickly. Uh, one is Japan is trying to uh, enhance its own defense capabilities. Uh, the U.S. and Japan are m working much more closely together, uh, you know, sharing roads, and mission, uh, roads, missions, and capabilities between us, the two armed forces, how to share roads and uh, to maintain peace in this region. And thirdly, uh, possibly most in importantly, we are trying, the U.S. and Japan, both of us, are trying to cooperate more closely with the countries in the le region, especially India, Australia, <coughs> and Southeast Asian countries. 
and hopefully South Korea, but uh, it's <laughs> kind of being uh, quite diff difficult, a little difficult. Why? Because China is growing like uh, in the past 10 years, Chinese defense uh, expenditure has uh, increased by like 80%. Mm -hmm while the U.S. defense expenditure has declined by 1.7 percent or something, according to uh, uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. And the Japanese one has increased by 2.5 or something like that. If you to end it, uh, the U.S. is the largest spender of defense, followed by China. Japan is currently on, uh, in the ninth place. And where are other countries? India is now, I think, is fourth, uh, uh, fifth, fourth or fifth largest spender on defense, massive strategic power. Uh, South Korea is in the 10th place just after Japan and uh, quickly catching up with Japan. It's, uh, you know, defense expenditure has uh, increased by like 30% uh, uh, in the past decade. Uh, Australia is with its uh, uh, population of 25 million is in the 13th place. Amazing. So our calculation is if we bring these two countries together and if we start cooperating more closely together, we might not be able to outdo, outcompete China, but we will probably be able to maintain the balance of power in the region very well. Do you have something to add on that? So I think at this point we'd like to turn to questions. and. I see that I have some questions from the lazy people. No, I'm just <laughs> But um, we're, we're very happy that you're not lazy. They send us questions. So um, let's see. Let me. Um, and I, I will open the, um, the floor to, for questions for the diligent people who came in the rain, too. Um, so let me start uh, with. Um, OK, let me. Okay, I, I think this is related to what you just mentioned, and okay. I need my reading last. But um, so, um, could the speakers talk a bit on the quad? Mm -hmm. oh, there are peri yeah. periodically hope of talk of revival, but nothing seems to happen. President Trump is in India right now, and do you have any thoughts about that? Mm. So the quad mm -hmm. idea was an idea that Japan, the United States, Australia, and India could more closely collaborate in terms of security, especially, right? It was uncomfortable for certain uh, folks in New Delhi because it was overly um, military focused, security focused, as, as Michita Sensei just said. Um, I think there was also resistance in Australia and because there was some division of opinion in Australia about whether or not that kind of hard power alliance, sort of pseudo alliance was really appropriate for the region. So there's been dissonance in different countries at different times. And I think it right now, my sense is I don't see much real impetus to restart the quad mm -hmm. in a kind of formalistic way. But I do think you've got an awful lot of overlap of interest between those four countries. Nobody here will, will ignore the fact that those are all democratic countries, first and foremost, right? Mm -hmm. They are also maritime countries. Uh, so you have a lot of exercising between the, the countries involved. Malabar exercises, which used to be the United States and India, now have the United States, India, and Japan involved. Uh, the Australians work quite closely with the United States and Japan as well. So you've got these trilateral groupings within these four countries. But I don't see any movement towards formalizing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like a pseudo alliance. Right. That, mm -hmm. that aspect of the quad, I think, is probably not suitable for the moment. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we don't have to say we are coming, you know, we don't want to look like we are ganging up uh, <laughs> against China, right? We are not. Because, you know, in the way, I talk always talk about uh, uh, our effort to maintain the balance of power in this region. This is certainly good for us, hopefully. But it's actually good for China because mm -hmm. by maintaining the balance of power in this region, we are kind of discouraging hard-lying, crazy people in the Chinese leadership from taking the upper hand, right? Because creating the, by creating the situation where if, you know, you know this uh, aggressive type of Chinese leader say, well, we have to use force to, you know, uh, take this and take that, you know, more moderate, more reasonable leaders can say, okay, you say it, but we cannot do it and get away with it, right? So we have to be really uh, take more cooperative path in order to 
create a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great idea, actually. We tend to, you know, think this as a hostile action. No, it's actually good for China, too. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question from Emo because it's related. Um, the question is, improving defense cap capacity is more than equipment, but also partnerships, interoperability, etc. Is there alignment or at least of significance on Japan with ASEAN nations, Australia, India? And I'd like to sort of ask the ASEAN nations part, because I understand, Dr. Michista, you're the director of the Maritime Safety and Security Policy Program yes. at the National um, Graduate Institute of Policy Studies, which is a collaborative program between GRIPS and the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. which is related to capacity building in the region. So if you can add a little bit about right. what are the efforts that Japan is doing right. um, for capacity building and how that is related to the um, relationship or relationship building within the region for Japan on the defense side, too, mm -hmm. which has been difficult sure. in the past. By the way, she, she said GRIPS. GRIPS is a National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, which is a GRIPS is an acronym uh, of a school, which is a graduate only a school only school, in, based in Tokyo. And uh, actually, GRIPS is a good name for a school because uh, it means brain in German, right? But when I said this, uh, one person raised his hand and said, "GRIPS in French, GRIPS means influenza." <laughs> <laughs> So we stick to German, right? <laughs> anyway, so what we are doing, we have this uh, maritime safety and security policy program uh, which, with which we bring together up to 10 uh, junior Coast Guard officers from the countries in the Indo-Pacific region. We have this year uh, two from Japan, two from Sri Lanka, one from the Philippines, uh, one from uh, Malaysia, uh, one from India, right? And uh, one from uh, Thailand, and uh, well, that's, I think, about it. And um, what we do is to, basically, this is a part of a Japanese government effort to provide capacity building assistance to the countries in the region, in which, because, you know, ASEAN countries individually are not very powerful, right? That doesn't have, their Coast Guard uh, organization don't have, um, High tech, you know, cutting edge, um, or enough number of uh, patrol boats and things. So, we bring together these uh, young officers and educate them, and you know, um, have them acquire a master's degree program, a uh, master's degree within one year, and uh, you know, send them back. And while we they study, certainly they acquire new knowledge and you know, um, skills. But uh, they, at the same time, network, you know, create network of Coast Guard um, uh, members, officers uh, uh, in this region. And uh, while we do so, so this is actually, this program is uh, sponsored by JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. So this is a part of the Japanese government effort. That's an aid organization. And as a part of the same effort, uh, Japan has uh, pr been providing uh, patrol boats to the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and uh, Sri Lanka, and other uh, countries. And the good news, one good, very good news to us is that uh, one of our graduates from this uh, Maritime Safety and Security Policy Program has become a captain mm -hmm. of that two, one of the two ships that Japan provided to Sri Lanka. So we are proud of him and mm -hmm. proud of what's going on. Okay. That's great. Thank you. So um, thank you for the questions by email from um, our online viewers. And now I'd like to turn to the audience here. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you so much for a great uh, seminar today. My name is Takeuchi. I'm a co-hire of uh, Dr. Michishita from Minister of Defense and Rikotan Sensei. Um, I, I have two questions. One, uh, well, uh, money is about Japan, the South Korea relationship. So Dr. Michista says, oh, South Korea actually do not think fear about Japan. Yeah, that's true, but uh, what about Japanese sentiment? <laughs> Japanese sentiment might be damaged, damaged, damaged based on the, the South Korea's like uh, news articles. And then, uh, so that, that was very bad news for me. And Japan is actually the, the rear base of the US combined, UN combined, combined forces to uh, defend South Korea. And, like, and so how Japan and South Korea can 
actually change the situation because this is really bad because Japan is actually legally bind to support South Korea and that, that's fine. But also this situation might long and what if that that called Japanese sentiment and that impede actual uh, like a Japanese support in case of uh, South, uh, South Korean or Korean Peninsula in contingency. Then the second question is simple. Uh, now North Korea is a very good um, um, like excuse for Japanese uh, defense policy because everything is like oh it's against North Korea, <laughs> not for other big two countries. And but uh, what if if like now so North Korea become like a more friendly country, and then how uh, post North Korea? What's the difficulty for Japan to build their own military policy, especially not provoking two countries or like just, you know, especially Chinese uh, threat or Chinese counter uh, action for the Japan's new strategy against China or Russia? Well, I understand the sentimental, uh, I mean, sentiment is important, but I'm more realist than constructivist. Um, really, is, you know, kind of emphasizing the importance of balance of power, uh, while constructivists uh, emphasize the importance of uh, perceptions and sentiment and things. So I would say because the uh, because China is rising so rapidly and the North Korea is uh, becoming nuclearized and more, you know, possessing larger capabilities, military capabilities. It's only natural for South Korea to eventually choose uh, Japan and the U.S. I'm, com you know, I'm fairly uh, um, sure of that. So I'm not too concerned about that, you know, sentiment, because I mean, the sentiment comes and go, uh, well, but power does not comes and go. It, con you know, it stays. So I would say. Hopefully, so I tell uh, you know South Korean friends all the time, saying that well you can you know kind of uh, try to fight with you know kind of argue with us, but actually you are undermining your own strategic position, right? You in order to f you know so China has been kind of uh, bullying South Korea, right? But in order not to be bullied, you have to be to have maintain a amicable relationship with Japan and the US, then your bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis China would enhance. Why don't, why don't you do it? That's my message. Well, it's up to them oh, you know, whether, or to, you know, whether to take it or not, my advice or not. Second one was uh, North Korea. North Korea. Um, not North Korea. As post being a, North Korea. Like uh, post it's, North Korea. Yeah. Well, it's more already actually Jap Japanese uh, defense policy has is a, we are talking about post North Korea uh, security needs. Uh, you know, we have deployed. Japan has spent more like uh, about eighteen billion dollars on missile defense capabilities. That's a lot of money, and most of them are basically aimed at you know kind of geared toward uh, defending against North Korean missiles, right? And now, uh, whatever the new capabilities that we are talking about are geared more toward uh, dealing with China. Right? So already, Japanese, the, f the focus of Japanese defense policy have shif shifted away from North Korea and China. But we don't want to, you know, we don't want to antagonize China. Our, you know, ultimate goal is to create a, you know, cooperative relationship with China. China is, a, I would say, sec second most important country to Japan after the U.S., right? So. That's our goal, and uh, we are kind of trying to, you know, do, we don't want to emphasize the competitive part of it, but uh, we are competing while cooperating. Can I just, yes. just a footnote? I, I, don't, I, I say this without any sense of, of happiness, but I don't think you're not going to have to worry about North Korea <laughs> for some time. I think the North Koreans have made it very clear that they are not uh, ready for denuclearization. I think their investment and their testing of missiles, as you know, has proven that they're more interested in enhancing their arsenal rather than in reducing their armament. So I am not an optimist when it comes to a, a early resolution of, of that particular problem. I, I, I do think just it, it bears, it bears reemphasizing that Japan's official defense policy for some time now has actually put China uh, at, the, at the top of the list in terms of long-term existential concerns 
for Japanese security. So unless you anticipate that the Japanese public will take issue with that stance, it seems to be a pretty firm priority for Japanese defense planning. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, David James with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. I had a question about um, cybersecurity and wondering if you could talk a bit about the ways in which the U.S. and Japan um, are collaborating on cybersecurity issues. Uh, Kate Don Ren, as you know, on the business side has said there's significant shortage of the number of experts in Japan in this area. Uh, what about on the sort of more general uh, security side and how will that play into uh, the relationship? Well, um, we are uh, working very closely together on cybersecurity, the two countries. But the, at the current situation, at the present time, the U.S. is much, much, much more ahead of Japan, right? So what we are doing, we, when we say we are cooperating, what it means actually is the U.S. helping us, right? So we are learning from the American friends. To enhance how to, to find out how to enhance our cyber security, Americans, you know, specialists, tells us, here is a problem, here is a problem, here is a problem, and we try to fix them, and uh, we, you know, kind of uh, train together, uh, try to, you know, we actually our people, Japanese officials, participated in a cyber security uh, simulation game organized in the U.S. Uh, I think last year was it. Uh, so that's what we are doing, and uh, we are cooperating and learning a lot from the yeah, American friends. And I'm, I thank you for that. So David, you know it's, it's important. It's, it, you mentioned Kay Dunren's sort of statement about capabilities. In the world of cyber, it's not just state-owned capability, although those are very important for offensive reasons, obviously. But, um, but there's also the private sector capacities that need to be there as well. And so I think there's both sides. There's mm -hmm. both the state security apparatus, mm -hmm. that kind of thinking, but there's also the kind of, you know, keeping three steps ahead, or at least trying to keep three steps ahead of who, I, who might be hacking you tomorrow, uh, is, an, is a full-time right, occupation for private sector actors as well as for government actors. So both pieces of that, I think Japan is trying hard to make sure it's developing the capacities it needs, and in particular, in advance of the Tokyo Olympics. Let me just refer to one more question that came by email. Um, I thought this was the most interesting live stream event today, but it seems like there's something else called the democratic debate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So not as interesting as this one, but there's, that's <laughs> happening, too. And related to that, um, there's a question. Uh, democratic debate or is tonight Trump or Bernie? And it says um, <laughs> a message from John that I think this is in context of the U.S.-Japan relations, where it better be. Mm -hmm. But how do you think of the state of the, then it, he, the question says Bernie, we don't know yet, but how would the elections <laughs> affect U.S.-Japan alliance in any way if there's any thoughts sure. on that? So we, we've been talking a lot about President Trump and his priorities and the way he thinks about alliances and the ways in <clears throat> which he's raised questions, right, about the value of alliances to the United States, both in the trade realm and in this burden sharing aspect as well. Um, I think if you look at all of the Democratic candidates, and I, 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 uh, I, not, I, I am not aware that, that Bernie Sanders has talked about burden sharing, but <laughs> other candidates actually have raised the issue of alliances mm -hmm. as being strategic assets of the United States and should be partners in whatever it is we do, whether it's in the economic realm or in the strategic realm. So I think you're seeing the candidates recognize that that's one aspect of American foreign policy that has been weakened. Uh, or they're worried that it has been weakened. So you, you can see that in some of the tweets and some of the statements by, mm -hmm. by candidates. Bernie Sanders was on 60 Minutes the other night, I believe, um, where he was asked very explicitly about Asia. He was asked about Taiwan and use of force uh, in a Taiwan scenario. And he didn't say no. He mm -hmm. said, well, that's certainly a, a challenge. So <laughs> what you're going to start to see, and this is normal in the right. primary process, as we get closer and closer to identifying a Democratic uh, frontrunner, mm -hmm. they will be increasingly asked these national security questions, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the Obama-Hillary uh, Obama mm -hmm. uh, debate, right? When, when the 3 o'clock phone, phone call, call, how are you yeah. going to respond? So these questions will start to be put to the people who are remaining mm -hmm. in the race after Super Tuesday. So I would stay tuned for more mm -hmm. of a sort of digging deeper mm -hmm. kind of approach on China, right. on Asia, on trade 
And obviously, the alliances will also, I think, be part and parcel of that. Use of force questions in particular. Right. Is that something that is discussed no, no. in Japan? Or? Um, we, have, we don't know what the <laughs> you know, uh, democratic <laughs> candidates stand for right. when it and, comes to the... Right. Uh, yeah. So, yes. So, um, in the back over there? Hello, my name is Matthew Carpenter. I'm a Japanese linguist and consultant. My question is, how does President Trump's personal relationship with the North Korean leader impact the diplomatic and security framework in East Asia? Um, not much so far, because well, certainly there are optics, right? You know, interesting optics, but nothing uh, significant or meaningful has come out of it, right? So we uh, kind of keep our eyes on what's going on, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, kind of, um, you know, intentions, Mr. Kim's, you know, what, what, he's, what he's going to do next. But, I mean, you know, think everything is open-ended uh, at this point. So we just, you know, hope, you know, keep our eyes on it and while, you know, kind of uh, trying to be as uh, optimistic as possible. So I think you can see after the Singapore summit, there were certain questions asked because mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you remember, but in the press conference after the Singapore summit, mm -hmm. President Trump mentioned that military exercises were provocative mm -hmm. and they were expensive. Mm -hmm. And he was referring, of course, to the U.S. ROK. Mm -hmm. um, and the press began to ask the Japanese defense minister, well, what did you think about that? So there are very judicious statements about how military exercises among allies are very important you know, demonstrations of the, of the alliance. So the, I think the Japanese government in particular has been cautious Prime Minister Abe himself has been very supportive of the effort to engage in denuclearization, while also advocating for maintaining maximum pressure with, via sanctions. Mm -hmm. So I think Japan's position is very clear. Unless North Korea brings something to the table, then the collective effort, the international effort mm -hmm. to continue the sanctions is important. Uh, it's an instrument of pressure on Pyongyang. Yes. Thank you very much for your insight. Uh, I may uh, ask you two questions. The one is about the Chinese strategy with the Pacific Ocean. Uh, during World War II, Japan expanded the line to the Gadar Canal in South Pacific. And of course, now the military capability and all technology has changed. So that the, what is the Chinese strategy with Pacific Ocean? It's a big gap between China and the United States. And my second question is, what is the current relationship with the Russian government and Chinese government about the security issue? I'll answer the first one. <clears throat> well, China, what China is doing right now is to make it difficult for the U.S. strike forces uh, like uh, carrier strike uh, group from uh, approaching the Chinese East Coast or approaching Taiwan to defend Taiwan in case of conflict. And uh, so for that purpose, China has uh, created the concept of a first island chain and second island chain. First island chain goes through the Ryukyu Island, uh, Taiwan, and the first, uh, second island chain goes through Guam in the kind of uh, Western Pacific. So China is basically making, and uh, China is field, fielding uh, or trying to become capable of fielding uh, attack submarines, guided missiles, uh, submarines with uh, guided missiles, uh, anti-ship uh, guided missiles. And uh, China has also deployed uh, anti-ship uh, basic missiles. When you say anti-ship, ship means uh, U.S. aircraft carriers. And uh, what's changing, and, but the thing is, interestingly, what the Soviet Union and the United States were doing during the Cold War were, have a lot in common what, with what the, uh, China and the U.S. are doing. As the Soviet Union drew its own defense lines and tried to stop China, uh, the U.S. strike forces uh, from coming close. What changed is technology. Now, uh, sensor technology is much more advanced than before, and long-range firepower has advanced. So now um, people think that aircraft carriers have become more vulnerable to long-range strikes. 
So I would say what's going to be important is to electric warfare, you know, because unless you identify the whereabouts of the strike groups, carrier strike groups, it's impossible. You know, whatever the long range missiles, whatever assets you might have, you might you cannot attack them. Right. So I would say, you know, so this is a, you know, cat and mouse, uh, you know, competition. But uh, I would say uh, electric warfare, you know, em emission control, different maneuvering tactics, and the uh, jamming uh, capabilities and things like that. Those would be crit become critical in this uh, uh, round, round of uh, uh, comp great power competition in the Pacific. Mm. So two, two brief uh, answers to your, both your questions. On the maritime side, we've already seen China begin, begin to operate, as, as Professor Michishita said, in the inland seas, East China Sea, South China Sea, so the maritime regions close to China. But you're now also beginning to see maritime forces operate from at, at distance. So you see them all the way around to the, the Middle East, right, and the, the sea lanes that go all the way around there, which are just as vital ports being established, the string of pearls, right? Um, but you also see other, other forces other than the PLAN operating. So the Coast Guard is operating all the way down with Indonesia is now having a tit for tat over the Natuna Islands, right, with the Chinese. And then there's militia forces as well. So I think what you're seeing is kind of a proliferation of different kinds of maritime presence by the Chinese, not just in areas close but in areas increasingly further away from, from Chinese borders or Chinese uh, coastlines. On your China-Russia question, I think the important thing here is, again, how they're behaving together in the region. So you see a lot of, not a lot, but you see a lot more cooperation between Russian and Chinese for military forces. So whether they're maritime patrols, some of which have uh, been in the contiguous zones by the Senkaku Islands, right, by our allies. Also, you saw last year the joint air patrol in the disputed islands between Japan and South mm -hmm. Korea. Again, that was taking advantage, I think, or exploiting the moment of tension between mm -hmm. the U.S.'s allies in the region. So you're seeing military collaboration and demonstration of, uh, of maritime and air capabilities, especially around Japan, but in that, in that area that are very worrisome, I think, to, to us and to our allies in the region. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Russia, Moscow, and Beijing will always see eye to eye on longer term strategic competition because they themselves will have uh, independent interests. Mm -hmm. But for now, you're seeing their militaries operate in greater frequency and in much closer coordination, uh, I think, than you've seen in the past. Yes, so the seven, yes. Thank you. Um, it seems a matter of time before Japan decides to formally make the decision to uh, make a greater contribution to maintaining peace in the region. It just seems that historically Japan makes these attempts to isolate th themselves, but eventually some event ends up precipitating Japan's decision to uh, step out in into the world and take a greater um, role of participation in foreign affairs. Japan is seen as a leader in robotics and, and artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of talk in the intelligence communities about the role presently and in the future of AI in foreign policy and potential planning of military conflicts, specifically with China. It's even sometimes AI is talked about as a race between the United States and the People's Republic to see who can develop the greatest military capacity to use AI in the future. Where do you all see the role of Japan's development of AI in robotics in any potential um, future conflicts or Japan's decision, which I, I kind of believe is going to happen, to take a greater role in maintaining peace in the Pacific region? Unfortunately, Japan is uh, lagging behind uh, in applying AI or robot technologies to military use because of the sentiment, I would say. And uh, actually, the Japanese government tried to make it possible, to, or is trying to, even right now, uh, to uh, kind of use some uh, civilian technologies and you know, use it in uh, defense use. 
But uh, for example, there is a kind of uh, association for academicians in Japan which said, no, you sh- we shouldn't be. And the Jap- actually, the Ministry of Defense created the fund, new fund, to finance、uh, the kind of、uh, basic、uh, research on different t y p e of technologies which can be used both for civilian and military use. But this association of academicians said, no, we shouldn't. The university researchers must not be doing it. So there is, a, you know, even today, a tug, and war, a tug of war between the two groups of people. You know, I would say isolationist and in, internationalist in a, a slightly different setting. So we'll see. But uh, uh, at this point, Japan is actually lagging behind that. I would just, as a footnote, it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think, like, like all of Japanese society, Japan's future demographic trends are causing not only the private sector, but also the military planning, planning community to think about technology as one way of compensating for the decline in the, in the Japanese workforce. So, the initiative that, that、uh, Professor Michishita was talking about here is an agency in the Ministry of Defense. That is trying to leverage Japanese technological prowess for compensating for some of the, the, the shortcomings that may eventually affect military defensive capabilities. So, but I think, as he said, it's a, it's a, it'll be a slow kind of transition because the Japanese private sector and engineers and scientists are a little bit resistant to applying their knowledge to military purpose.、Mm-hmm. So it may not be as forward leaning as you might suggest, but their technological capability is certainly. Something that the, the military is interested in, in developing. So, unfortunately, our time is up.、Mm-hmm. Um, thank you very much to our online viewers for joining us and sending us questions. And thank you for coming to、um, this event today. Finally, I'd like to、um, give a round of applause to our two wonderful speakers. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.